All right. Here we go. Yes, this is, I hope you brought <coughs> your children's children or your children. No? Okay, well, that's what Stephen Hawking thinks. What now appears the paradoxes of quantum theory will seem as just common sense to our children's children. I thought I wouldn't wait. Um, so, uh, the other day, I was uh, browsing through YouTube, thinking about quantum physics, as you do, uh, and came across a new, at least new to me, bit on uh, the double slit experiment, in which uh, Professor Jim al Khalili promised to explain it. Uh, he, of course, did no such thing, uh, but he did describe it very well, and he said something that caught my interest in the context of the Hawking group that was up there. Uh, one thing led to another, and here we all are, you unwittingly, I on purpose. Uh, how many of you already know of the double slit experiment? Oh, good. <laughs> so you will have the advantage. Um, Okay, well, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll nip through it as we go. Um, the double slit experiment, if you don't already know, was hailed by Richard Feynman, who you also may not know, uh, as the central, indeed only, mystery of quantum physics. He meant only in the sense that if you could understand it, then you could understand all of quantum theory. He also famously said that no one understood quantum theory, including him, so don't get your hopes up. <laughs> uh, Richard Feynman was the famous bongo playing, showgirl sketching, mildly philandering, uh, key mind behind quantum electrodynamics. He didn't like the name, but he loved the initials. Um, and most importantly, he discovered and developed what he called the sum over histories, what we now call half integral technique for calculating the probabilities that define quantum behavior. We'll go into that in a bit once you've had time to warm up. <laughs> but first, a little background. There's always been a question among some people, perhaps not you, uh, as to whether light travels in waves or is made up of particles. Newton, Isaac Newton just knew it was particles, corpuscles he called them, and no one argued with it on anything actually but this too. Uh, and that's how it stayed for a couple of hundred years until at the very beginning of the 19th century, Thomas Young, known as the last man who knew everything, <laughs> thought he would settle the issue with an experiment, the double slit experiment. It had dawned on him that if light came in waves, then they would ripple. And if they came from two sources, the ripples would interfere with each other, just as they do on duck ponds, so he would be able to see it. How do you get light to come from two sources? You let it in from one source, and then split it, whence the two slits. It's clever, no? Anyway, this is what he got. It's called an interference pattern. It's what happens when the peaks and troughs of the waves accentuate or cancel each other out. Uh, if it looks a little bit fuzzy, that's because his light box was really small, so one eyeball at a time small. They're much bigger now. So that settled that for another hundred or so years until 1905, when Einstein came up with the idea of photons and quanta and were back to particles. The resulting confusion is known as wave-particle duality, or as Einstein put it, we have two contradictory pictures of reality. Uh, separately, neither of them fully explains the phenomenon of light, but together they do, and the double slit experiment comes back into its own. Al-Khalili's setup is essentially the same as, the, as Young's, a single light source split into two with a screen to display the result. This works perfectly for demonstrating wave-like interference patterns, if that's what you want to do. There is one important difference, however, between other experimenters and Al-Khalili when it comes to discussing particle light -like behavior, where most people simply turn down the intensity of the light source until it releases only one photon at a time. Professor Jim uses atoms from an atom gun. I have no idea 
where you get an atom gun. Um, but one thing we do know about atoms is you can't split them, not with impunity. As particles, atoms can only go through one slit or the other, so cannot interfere with each other. Which means the waveform has to be a real wave. And there's the mystery. The first time we see the gun, uh, he's taped over the top slit. And we can clearly see particles on the screen behind, slightly scattered, but perhaps normal for atoms. Who knows? The next time, when the second slit is also open, uh, the, we see the particles build up in an interference pattern, just like waves, even when the atoms are sent through one at a time. So when there are two slits, not just one, each atom must know its place and go there. Now, just using the word know is a sign that we're in some trouble. The professor's solution, check to see how many go through which slit and where they end up. Turns out, know, he puts a detector, sorry, on the top slit to count those atoms and then we can assume that the others went through the bottom slit. So what do we find? Turns out each atom does go through one slit or the other. Sorry, there's the detector and there it is. Right? The atoms have met no, no interference pattern. The atoms have noticed the detector and have decided to behave like good little atoms and not puzzle people. But the people are still puzzled. Obviously, it must be the detector. But there is one more test. Don't touch the setup that the atoms can see. Just unplug the detector. Pretend to be checking, but don't actually do it. It's sneaky, I know, but everyone's fed up by now and wants to go home. <laughs> you can guess what happens. The atoms are not fooled. They know the plug's been pulled, and they go back to the waveform display. It's at this point that he catches my interest, as I said at the beginning. If he can explain this... Oops, sorry. This is locked up for a bit. Nope, it's locked up. Is it locked? Yep. I don't know. Ah, there. The magic. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. It's at this point he catches my interest. As I said, he, he, said, he says, if you can explain this using common sense and logic, do let me know because there's a Nobel Prize for you. Well. I may not be able to do the maths, but logic, common sense, well, logic, I can do that. This is what we in the trade call a challenge. <laughs> Possibly a threat, but definitely a challenge. One small warning though, the logical explanation is actually quite dull. It can't be helped, that's logical. Okay, but first, a little background. To understand what's going on here, you need to know a couple of things about time. Nothing drastically different from what you already know, just a bit more specific in parts. Let's start with stuff you already know. Time comes in three flavors, past, present, and future, or to put them in their correct sequence, future, present, and past. Who here thinks the uh, past comes before the future. Nobody. Oh, well, that's excellent. That's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of people do. Physicists do. Um, for instance, here's Sean Carroll's. Oh, sorry, future. Here's Sean Carroll's uh, diagram of the arrow of time, starting in the past and heading into the future. Could be the arrow of us, I suppose, uh, but actually it's just time flowing in the other direction that makes us think that that's the direction we're going. If time were a river, we'd be going upstream. However, remember the film friends analogy because that'll come in handy. Um, Carroll isn't the only one, though. Feynman made the same mistake with his sum over histories, which actually were futures. Um, 
so uh, he was very smart. Um, not that Carroll isn't smart, or indeed, actually, I'm sure in their own way, all physicists, anyway, look, we're getting on a little bit far. Um, back to types of time. Let's start with the easy ones, beginning with the future. Right? Can we agree that the future consists entirely of stuff that might possibly happen, but hasn't happened yet, if it ever does? Anybody disagree? No, I'll take that as a Now, the past. Who thinks the past consists entirely of stuff that's already happened? Yes, good. All right, see, I told you this was easy. Um, now, for the present, which is not quite so straightforward. Uh, don't worry, present is still where everything happens. Um, but the question is, how long does it last? My feeling is that everybody thinks, oh, sorry, my stuff is happening now. I'm not sure I'm going to push this. My feeling is everybody thinks the present lasts long enough to get things done, like the laundry, for instance. But that can't really be true. Things like laundry are too complicated. And everything has to happen in the right sequence. Take the detergent, for example. There's a lot to do before you or the machine adds the detergent. While it's still in the future, then the time comes, it goes into the wash, and at the same time, into the past. It's all over for the detergent. It's too specific. I've now worried you about laundry. Um, let's, let's think of something else. What about wiggling? Is there wiggliness in our future? It's possible, even probable. And yes, here it is. <laughs> Boom, into the past. Right? Perhaps there's another one on this way. Yes, again. Boom, into the past. It turns out that compared to the future and the past, the present is just a flash in the pan. It, the important thing, though, is that this is an irreversible process. It never goes the other way. Nothing ever comes out of the past, into the present, acquires the probabilities it needs, and then becomes a future possibility. That has never happened. It can't happen, obviously. Time only flows in one direction, that's into the past, and that's as true in the quantum realm as in the macro world. Back to the present. We call it the present because it can't contain any before, which is the future, and it can't contain any after, which is the past, so there's no changing at all, just now. So it has to be short. On the other hand, it can't exist for no time at all, because then nothing could exist. So how short is it? I think it's very, very short. <laughs> My best bet is that it's a unit of Planck time, and there are 10 million, billion, 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 billions, that's 10 to the 43rd, of them in each second of our time. At the speed of light, that's how long it takes to form a photon. And that's not a coincidence. That's too short for anything to happen during it. It can happen, but nothing else. And there's no time between presents, obviously. So they're just on, off, binary. This is the source of the famous quantum leap. Not the TV show, but the fact that they just pop into being and then they pop out. And like Sean Carroll's film frames, nothing happens within each present, but uh, the sequence of slightly different presents gives the impression of seamless reality. And that's it. That's all you have to know about that and about quantum physics and this one rule. If nothing happens, nothing happens. That's all you have to remember. It's quite simple, really. Now, you may well ask, is there any proof of what I'm saying? And I have to tell you that there is, and it's called the double slit experiment. <laughs> uh, so, we'll go through it again, but logically this time. What you see here, right, um, sorry, what you see here, is the default mode, what I call the uneventful state, where nothing happens at all. Notice, by the way, you can observe this as long as you want, uh, until the cows come home of their own accord, if you like. There is no observer effect, if, that's what, if you've heard of that. Uh, you won't make anything happen 
by observing. Anyway, back to being uneventful. What do you mean, I hear you cry? There's all kinds of stuff happening. True, but as usual in the quantum realm, uneventful has a very specific meaning. An event is anything that alters what's happening. So long as what might happen to an element remains unchanged, then successive presence will remain in that state until something actually happens, i.e. some event, like hitting the screen, causes an instantaneous change to a past, or what is called particle, event, state, which then simply becomes part of the fabric of the universe in that form. In quantum terminology, this is Schrodinger's wave function working its way through um, Feynman's probability amplitudes of where atoms will end up. I should explain. Probability amplitudes are just odds. If these were the quantum races, uh, bookies will be shouting, the probability amplitude of Mama's boy is winning is 10%, i.e. 10 to 1, Mama's boy. Schrodinger, he of the half dead cat. Yes, oh well, okay. Repeat <laughs> yourselves. Anyway, his wave function just defines the shape, the shape of wave those odds produce. Bear in mind, though, that probability waves are just information. There's nothing solid to go through the slits, so nothing has to split. Anyway, just to tie this up, where do you find probabilities? In the future! Right? And I'm afraid, amazing though it is that we see anything at all, that's all we get to see of the future. The pattern left once future probabilities have become past particles. Under normal circumstances, of course, there wouldn't be any interference pattern. That's just caused by the double slits. Normally, what we would see would look like the opening scene from Poltergeist. What we used to see when the BBC went off there. <laughs> All right, that's the uneventful situation. But what happens when something happens, when there's an event? For that, we have to go to the detector sequence. I think we can agree that detecting is an event. Right? It's, uh, we're now in the active present. The first thing, obviously, is that the probabilities drop to what's actually happening. No more future. This is now happening. And the laws of physics kick in. This is known in the trade as probability wave function collapse. And nobody knows what causes it, except me and all of you now. But the past process starts here. However. That doesn't mean that everything stops. On the contrary, everything carries on in that form until something else happens in the screen. The, this willingness to keep calm and carry on is called inertia. Um, in case you were wondering, it is also called behaving like a particle, which it is until it hits the screen when it becomes a past particle. Turn the, the detector off, however, um, and uh, we're back to the uneventful probability now, right? So, this is perfectly normal. This is the default quantum state, the combination of uncommitted future and uneventful present. Why do physicists get this wrong? Well, their problem is that the laws of physics appear to, uh, to show no arrow of time. Uh, there's that is because the laws of physics only apply in the present. Uh, there is only the, pre the present, and so there's nowhere for any arrow to point. The laws are implicit in the future, active in the present, and their effects, the past particles, form the fabric of the universe. I call this the Clapham interpretation, <laughs> along after the man in the Clapham on the bus. Along with the double slit experiment, it resolves a number of apparent paradoxes in quantum mechanics, among them the observer effect, Schrodinger's cat, the EPR paradox, the multiverse, the block universe, and the arrow of time, as I've said. It also provides a basis for a quantum theory of gravity in the form of loop quantum gravity, uh, with obvious implications for string theory, brain theory, and a holographic universe. It has a nice gut feel to it. 
That's G U T, Grand Unified Theory. Why? So shall I get get in touch with Alpha Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> simple, isn't it? <laughs> all very simple. All easily explained. Okay. And that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>